I uh, want to welcome all of you coming on uh, this afternoon. Uh, I hope this will be both educational and even maybe a little entertaining. It's a serious topic that we're talking about, but but I, I hope we can have a little little bit of uh, uh, fun with it. And I'm glad we have the reactions and people know. So people just coming on, if you don't, uh, if you haven't tried the reactions, uh, I've just learned, uh, people have pointed out to me, you can, you can hit the little uh, smiley face icon and you can do a thumbs up or you can do a thumbs down, uh, stuff like that. Uh, the other uh, thing that for me, I had to click on the top right, the chat uh, function. And once you do the chat function, uh, then you can, you, can do, uh, you can do the chat. And if you click the current room, which is what I've done, I can say, hello, everyone. And there is going to be uh, times when we're going to, I'm going to invite you to type things into the, uh, into the chat. Uh, people have their cameras off, I believe, which is fine. I respect it. Sometimes it's the best for one's bandwidth. And uh, uh, sometimes it's, you know, because you're, hey, Zoom or equivalent and nice to hang out in pajamas. I got no problem with that. Uh, I'm wearing tennis sneakers below my, my suit. So, you know, that's the advantage of being home on Zoom. People had a good day uh, so far. People attend the, the earlier session. Yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, I see a smiley face. Thank you, yes, and a thumbs up. All right, great, another thumbs up. <clears throat> so maybe I'm gonna give it just one more minute, <clears throat> then we're gonna get talking. Gonna talk about, oh, actually, what time is this supposed to start? Is it at four or four fifteen? It's four, right? I think so. Well, I already have a lot of you right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. When my clock, okay, let's let's go ahead and get get started. I um, I really appreciate uh, all of you coming and and joining me, and uh, I, I I want to encourage people coming on time or, or early. I don't want to punish people for coming on time. So we're going to go ahead and get started with the six steps to managing uh, Alzheimer's disease and, and dementia. And this is a slightly different platform than I'm used to, but I, I think it'll all work just, just fine. Ah, I see my good friend, Richard Isaacson is in the audience. Thank you for, for joining uh, uh, Richard and a lot of other people uh, uh, coming on board. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna give two minutes <clears throat> as the room is starting to, to fill up now. I think the other session must have just ended and everybody's sort of sorting themselves uh, out here. <clears throat> nice to see so many people. I see other, other faces. Um, and names that I know. So it's just wonderful. All right. So we're going to talk about um, this afternoon, uh, the six steps uh, to uh, managing Alzheimer's disease and, and dementia. And um, these are uh, my titles here, a little bit about me. Um, I'm the Chief of Cognitive Behavioral Neurology at the Veterans Affairs Boston Healthcare System. So I hang out at the VA most of the time, take care of our veterans. I'm also a professor of neurology at the BU School of Medicine. I lead up the outreach, recruitment, engagement, and education efforts at our Boston University Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. I'm also the Associate Director uh, there. And I'm also a lecturer in neurology at Harvard uh, Medical School. So uh, we're going to talk uh, about some of my books. And that's the only disclosure that I have is that I do get royalties for uh, publishing uh, uh, these books, a book from uh, uh, Elsevier, 
on uh, for clinicians, memory loss, Alzheimer's disease, and dementia, a practical guide for clinicians uh, from Oxford University Press for um, seven steps to managing your memory, what's normal, what's not, and what to do about it. And then for this new book, we're going to be talking about six steps to managing Alzheimer's disease and dementia, a guide for families. So that's my relevant disclosures. And here is the book that we'll be uh, talking about. And I'm going to begin my talk by reading a little bit from the uh, preface uh, of the book. And as I read through um, each uh, of these quotes from family members, if you have either experienced as a caregiver or heard something like this from a, a friend, a family member, or a colleague, I want you to give me a thumbs up if you've heard anything like this before. So here is the first uh here is the first one. I'm going to just turn my um, turn my uh, sharing off so, so we can concentrate here. So I always thought I had a lot of patience, but if he asked me what we are doing today one more time, I think I will scream. Does that sound familiar to anyone? So to use those reactions, if you go to the share a reaction, the little smiley face, you can do the, the thumbs up if that sounds familiar to you. Here is another <clears throat> quote. Um, I love my wife, but I have no time for myself. I haven't been able to go to the gym or visit my friends or even see my doctor. Sound familiar? Looks like it sounds familiar to some of you. How about this one? He wants to drive, but I don't know if it's safe. How about this one? I've never fooled around in my life. And now at age 83, my wife is accusing me of having an affair. Or how about this one? It's happening every evening now. She keeps saying that she needs to go home, but we're already home. Or sometimes this one can happen. When I came home from the hairdresser, he asked me who I was. He really didn't recognize me. So that's a little taste of some of the issues that we're going to be uh, covering in this uh, session uh, this afternoon. And so we're going to continue to um, go through the six steps in managing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And I'll just mention that in the introduction of the book, we introduce uh, two pairs of characters, two uh, individuals with dementia and, and, um, and their, uh, their loved ones who are caring uh, uh, for them. And we have a little story that goes through the book so that you can both sort of see some of these principles in action and also so that you can uh, sort of experience the journey along with them and have sort of a friend to go on this journey with uh, together. Now, step one is understand uh, dementia. And I begin with uh, the question that I get asked more than any other time, which is what's the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? And if you feel you know the answer to that, Go ahead and, and write the answer into the chat. What's the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? And to access the chat function, if you go to the top right-hand corner of the screen, uh, you can type in there, yes. And so Carrie has written it, Alzheimer's is a form of dementia. And that's exactly right. So dementia is a general term that simply means there's a decline in thinking and memory that is severe enough that it interferes with day-to-day -day function. And so the way I think about the word dementia as a general term is sort of like the way I think about another general term like a headache. Now, a headache can be from a lot of different causes. You can have, a, a say, a muscle tension headache or a migraine headache neither of which are very serious. 
but you can also have a headache for something that is quite serious, like a stroke or a brain tumor. And with dementia, it's the same way. You can actually have dementia from something as simple and as treatable as a vitamin deficiency or a thyroid disorder. But you can also have dementia from a variety of different brain diseases, including Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia or dementia with Lewy bodies, frontotemporal dementia, or even chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And there's many other types as well. So dementia is a general category and Alzheimer's is one type or one kind or one form of dementia. Let's talk about another term that some of you may have heard of, which is mild cognitive impairment. So mild cognitive impairment is when three things are, <clears throat> are present. So the first is that someone is concerned about the memory. It can be uh, the individual themselves, it can be their family, or it can be their doctor. The second is that when the individual undergoes pencil and paper testing, yes, indeed, a problem is found. So the concern is confirmed by the pencil and paper testing. But the third thing in mild cognitive impairment is their day-to-day -day function is fine. And if their day-to-day -day function is fine, then by definition, they do not have dementia. Now, if you follow people with mild cognitive impairment over time, about half of the people do end up declining and developing either Alzheimer's disease or another cause of dementia. But that also means the other half don't. The other half either stays stable or their memory actually improves over time. You might say, how does anybody's memory improve over time? Well, if the memory loss is due <clears throat> to depression, low mood. Well, when their mood lifts, their memory can get better. Another common cause of memory loss are medication side effects. And if the individual works with their doctor and their medications get adjusted, their memory can improve. Okay, so let's move now to step two, which is the heart of this book, which is manage uh, problems. And we talk first about general approaches to managing memory problems, managing problems in dementia. Then we had to talk about how to manage the memory problems, then the language problems, the vision problems, emotional problems, behavior problems, sleep problems, and problems with bodily functions. So all those different types, we have separate chapters on all of those. But we begin, we begin with some general approaches and I wanna talk about those general approaches with you uh, right now. So the first general approach I want to talk about are the four R's. So let's say we have a situation uh, that's similar to one of the quotes I gave in the introduction, where we have an individual with uh, dementia who is trying to leave the house. They're rattling the front door. They keep saying they need to go home, you know, should we like yell at them and say, stop trying to leave the house, you are home. We might feel like doing that, right? Uh, but we know we shouldn't really do that. So one approach is the four R's. So the first R is to reassure our loved one that everything is okay. The second R is to reconsider things from their point of view. So from their point of view, because of their memory loss, they may actually think of their home as where they grew up as a child. And maybe that's where they're trying to go to. So reconsider things from their point of view. The third R is redirect the individual away from whatever it is that's upsetting them and toward something that is both calming as well as distracting, so they won't think about whatever it is. And the fourth R is for all of us as caregivers, which is to take in a deep breath and relax. Because if we are getting frustrated or irritated or upset, 
uh, or annoyed that these problems are continuing to happen again and again, all we're going to do is escalate the situation. So we need to take a deep breath in and relax. Now, there's some other general approaches that can also be useful. And one of them is what we call the three time principles. So the first is that when you are communicating with your loved one, these are all communication principles. When you're communicating with your loved one, you want to take your time. You don't want to rush your communication with your loved one with dementia. It just doesn't go well. The other or the next important piece is one thing at a time. Don't tell your loved one to set the table and fill up the glasses with water, you know, and go get the bread out of the cabinet. You know, that's way too much for someone with dementia to remember. You know, just have them remember one thing at a time, okay? Maybe set the table or maybe even bring down the plates, uh, something like that, one thing at a time. And the other thing to remember is everyone appreciates honest, timely praise. So if your loved one does something well, reinforce it. Say, good job, well done. Thank you for helping me with that. Another thing that can be helpful is to start with small steps. And this can be particularly helpful if you're dealing with willfulness or stubbornness. So let's say you're trying to give your father a bath. He's like, I don't want to take a bath. I took a bath last year. And you're like, yeah, exactly right. You need another bath. I don't want to take a bath. All right. Well, sometimes you can't use the direct approach and you want to start with small steps. You might say, you know, dad, look, you just have a little bit of dirt on your nose. Can I just take this washcloth and just clean your nose? And, you know, now I see there's a little bit of dirt on your cheek. Let me clean your cheek as well. And look, you have a little bit on your neck. Let me clean your neck. And, oh, you know, I've got your shirt wet. Why don't we just take this shirt off because so I don't get it all wet. And then hopefully, slowly, piece by piece, uh, dad will uh, be undressed and hopefully into the tub. And if nothing else, you'll have been able to give him a sponge bath. So that's start with small steps. Now, sometimes all these little sort of tricks and rules of thumb, it's just not enough to sort out what's going on. And in that situation, I recommend the ABCs. And what I mean is to be uh, use the principles of behavior analysis, become a behavior analyst, okay? And look at the antecedents that come before the behavior, look at the behavior itself and measure it. How long is it? How intense is it? How often does it occur? Anything that you can measure about the behavior is very important because interventions often do not eliminate a behavior although they can make it much better, but you're only going to recognize that it's better or not if you measure it, okay? And then, of course, we want to look at the consequences of things as well, okay? So here is a little example you can see below. Again, it's bath time. So what happened? Well, the antecedents were it was time to take a bath. The behavior was yelling for seven minutes. What was the consequence? All right, dad, forget it. You don't want to take a bath. We'll, we'll do it tomorrow. So what did we just do? We just taught dad that if he yells loud enough and long enough, he's going to be able to get out of anything he doesn't want to do. Now, that may not have been a conscious learning that took place, but he will still learn it. He will learn that through operant conditioning. And uh, it's only going to cause more troubles in the future. So sometimes analyzing not only the antecedents and the behaviors, but also the consequences, the ABCs, will help you to understand difficult behaviors. Now, next, we talk about how to manage all sorts of uh, memory problems. 
And uh, there's individual strategies that can be used if people are mildly impaired. But something that most patients with Alzheimer's uh, we need to deal with and other forms of dementia is to unplug the stove, take the knobs off. We want to um, really try to eliminate wandering as much as we can. But I advise every family member uh, or every family at the first sign that your loved one may be wandering to make a plan. You know, the time to make a plan is not when they wandered out the door, okay? And you're trying to think of who to call and what to do and where's a picture of them that you can show the police. It's like, get all that information together ahead of time, okay? That's really important. And you can see there's a lot more things on these slides. I just don't have time to go over everything. So we're gonna sort of hit the highlights. And of course, you know, if you want more information, it does sound like the, uh, the workshops are gonna be posted on uh, YouTube. So you can review the information later at your leisure. You can check this book out of the, the library or get it you know, from whatever source you want. Uh, false memories are actually very common. It's something I do research on in my lab. And what I recommend, if your loved one says, oh, I was talking with my mother last night, and you're thinking, your mother's been dead for 30 years, you know, don't argue. Just say, oh, that's nice. And then try and turn the conversation over to something that's more uh, reality-based. Now, in addition to memory problems, there's all sorts of other problems that can come up in dementia. Language problems are very common. People have trouble finding words. They can have trouble comprehending. Now, of course, you always want to check the hearing because it could be they simply need hearing aids or new hearing aids or new batteries for their hearing aids or something like that. Uh, don't forget that you can use pictures to communicate with your loved one if they're having trouble uh, with spoken information. And the other thing to keep in mind is that nonverbal and emotional communication, such as tone of voice, facial expression, body language, this is generally preserved for quite a long time in dementia. So you really want to uh, uh, make sure that not only is the words you say, but all those nonverbal information is being communicated the way you want. You don't want to be frustrated and you know sitting with the crossed arms and other body language like that. Vision problems are very important to manage. People often have trouble recognizing family members. I'm sure you all know that siblings turn in and spouses and turn into parents. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, younger individuals turn into siblings. Um, they may actually know it's you, but they think you're an imposter. You're not the real George, you know, something like that. Those things can happen as well. We talk about how to manage you know, all those uh, problems. The, the hint, by the way, especially for the imposter, is to use the four R's. Uh, understand, reassure them, understand that it, it, it has to do with the dementia, and then try to redirect them to some other activity. Um, obviously, we want to make sure the vision and the glasses are good. Sometimes just increasing the lighting and contrast is good. And there are a lot of techniques to reduce the impact of hallucination using those techniques like the four R's that I was mentioning. Very few behavioral techniques will eliminate hallucinations, but you can reduce their damage, reduce the impact. Emotional problems are very common. People have anxiety and depression. If they have a little bit of insight, they're aware they're having memory problems. And obviously it's terrifying. The other thing that can happen sometimes is that individuals can develop what we call pseudobulbar affect, or sometimes it's called pathological laughing and crying. And we work in the book to try and tease them apart. And the short answer is you simply need to ask the individual if they're crying, are you feeling sad? You might assume, well, obviously they're feeling sad, they're crying, but that's what pseudobulbar affect is. It's when they're not feeling sad, but yet they're crying. And there's different treatments uh, for these two problems. So it's good to sort them out. What about managing driving? Well, the studies show 
that patients with very mild Alzheimer's disease have accident rates similar to 16 to 19 year old drivers. And we allow 16 to 19 year olds to drive in our society. Now we could have an interesting discussion about whether we should, but we do. And because of that, the question is, should we let patients drive with very mild Alzheimer's disease? Thumbs up or thumbs down? What do you think? I see a few reactions uh, popping up there. Again, you hit the smiley face and you can put in your thumbs up or your thumbs down. I see, I see, yeah, some people say yes, some people say no. Um, so what I recommend is that we have the family member ride in the passenger seat, you know, in the death seat monthly, okay? And if the family member is feeling comfortable uh, with the individual driving on whatever routes they normally do, then I feel comfortable with the individual uh, uh, driving. The studies show that adult children are the best judges of their parents driving. But if there's a controversy, uh, you can get a, a formal driving evaluation at either a local registry of motor vehicle or a rehabilitation uh, hospital. Behavior problems, of course, are all too common in individuals with uh, dementia. If there's apathy, somebody doesn't want to do anything, they sit on the couch all day, have a routine that they get up and go and do different things. You can work on sidestepping willfulness the way we talked about with the three time principles and small start with small steps. And uh, for agitation, aggression, combativeness, inappropriate, disinhibited behavior, I always recommend to begin with understanding what in the world is being meant by this term agitation. And if it's like being up in the middle of the night, well, then we work on addressing sleeping problems. If it's, you know, striking out with fists, well, then I'm going to recommend using those four R's, the three time principles, and perhaps uh, the ABCs, the antecedents, behaviors, and consequences. Now, another thing that comes up in uh, managing behavior problems is what's illustrated on this slide, right? Sundowning, right? So we want to look for medical problems. We want to stay safe. If people have guns or power tools, we want to give those away to the police or friends or, or a uh, uh, family. Sometimes the safe thing to do is to get out of the house if a situation is getting uh, out of control. <clears throat> um, the other thing is we want to plan around sundowning, right? Because, you know, if you know your loved one is just doesn't do well at 5 p.m. at night, well, they don't have a big, important family event that you want your loved one to be at at 5 p.m. at night. You know, have it in the morning, have it in the middle of the day, have it at a time when they're at their best. What if the problem is binge eating? Well, get rid of the unhealthy food. You can have healthy food around, and sometimes you have to lock the cabinets. I always recommend to my caregivers, never argue with jealousy and paranoia. It's not going to get you anywhere. Use the four R's. Sometimes music can actually be extremely helpful. And believe it or not, not only can real pets help our loved ones, but robot pets actually work quite well for a lot of individuals in the late stages of dementia. And even stuffed animals can be comforting. Well, what about sleep problems? <clears throat> sleep problems are so, so common. I always recommend to start with a sleep log. You know, uh, I had a clinic on Wednesday, and uh, one of my uh, families said, Doctor, you have to give my father a sleeping pill. He was up at four in the morning waking everybody up. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Well, let's just start by going through his sleep schedule. So what time does he go to bed? Oh, I put him to bed at eight o'clock. Like, okay, so I'm thinking, so if he goes to bed at eight o'clock, by four in the morning, he's had eight hours of sleep. With that particular family, that was all it was. You know, it, I explained that if they want uh, their loved one to sleep until six in the morning, he needs to go to bed at 10. If they want him to sleep till eight in the morning, then he has to go to bed at midnight. It's not any more complicated than that. 
you know, and this is not the answer that every family wants to hear, but I think that's the right answer, right? We don't want to give our loved ones medications to try and snow them to, so they can sleep for 10 or 12 hours. And don't forget that naps count as part of that total sleep time. So there's all sorts of different ways to improve sleep habits, right? We want to uh, no wakeful activities in bed, watch caffeine, especially uh, late in the day. Exercise should be early, should be calming activities at night. There are a lot of medical disorders that can cause sleep problems. So it's important to take a look for those. A little bit of melatonin at night can help sleep cycle disturbances. So melatonin is not really like a, a, a sedating sleeping pill, uh, but it can help if there's a sleep cycle disturbance. And believe it or not, acetaminophen, a plain old Tylenol, not Tylenol PM, but plain old Tylenol can help with aches and pains. Now, there are so many different ways to improve walking and reduce falls. I can't go over them all, but there's lots of different uh, ways that, uh, that you can help with these types of, of uh, uh, problems, uh, trouble with uh, walking and falls. Uh, there's also uh, a lot of different ways to help with bodily function problems, particularly incontinence. And I'm a big believer in using a toileting schedule. I can help make almost any patient with uh, dementia, at least through the middle stages, uh, continent, simply by having them go to the bathroom. Sometimes it's every two hours, sometimes it's every hour and a half, sometimes it's every hour, but it usually can, if not eliminate, greatly reduce uh, the incontinence. Now, sometimes the problem is incontinence at night, and there, there are specific strategies uh, that we will use we want to make sure they don't, you know, be eating a lot of fruit or drinking a lot of water right before they go to bed. I mean, I don't want them to get dehydrated, but too much fluids before bed can sometimes cause uh, nocturnal nighttime incontinence. And patients who have uh, edema or swelling in the legs, patients with Parkinson's disease may need to have their legs on a couch, uh, arms uh, sort of tilted up you know, so they're tilted like this, their feet are tilted up like this in order to drain the fluid from their legs into their kidneys and drain off the excess fluid. And of course, if you're having uh, situations outside of the house, you know, you need to work on being able to manage that type of uh, incontinence. There's ways to improve uh, food. You can improve tremor by using uh, heavy mugs and uh, silverwares to dampen uh, tremors, so many different things to do. So that's the bulk of the book about managing problems without using medications. But we do want to help individuals using medications. And the first thing I always want to do is get rid of all the medications that can be causing problems. So all of these different classes and in the book, we have lists, not just the classes, but we list the individual medications by name, generic name, brand name. So you can flip through the book and you can see if your loved one's medications are on the list. Um, these are a bunch of uh, medications that don't cause problems. Cholesterol lowering medications, statins are okay. Proton pump inhibitors are okay. Anesthesia, if it's properly administered, uh, it doesn't cause long-term memory problems. It'll make people confused for sure, but I don't think it causes permanent damage. Uh, and alcohol, don't kid yourself. One alcoholic beverage, it's not going to cause brain damage, but it will cause people to have worse memory and possible uh, confusion. And I'm a big believer, anyone with dementia, to use non-alcoholic beers and wines. Now, if you're using a medication to try and help with behavior, track it to see if it's working or not. Track the behavior, track the intervention, and track the effect. That's the only way to see if it works. Because again, medications like behavioral interventions, they rarely eliminate behaviors, but they can help. They can make it better. In terms of strategies to improve 
um, uh, uh, cognition and behavior, I always start, even if I'm trying to improve behavior, I always start with improving cognition, improving thinking and memory. Because if you think about it, your loved one didn't have the behavior when their thinking and memory was normal. So I start with the cholinesterase inhibitors like denepazil. And these medications work because I'm not going to go through all these slides. They actually help to boost up the levels of acetylcholine in the brain. And what they can do is they can actually turn the clock back on memory problems by six to 12 months. So when someone comes into my clinic, I can make their memory like it was six months ago, or maybe even a year ago. So if they weren't having the behavior six or 12 months ago, then this is a good medication to reach for, can help with uh, that uh, behavior. Now, there are, uh, now, should you stop these medicines? That often comes up. The short answer is you should not stop these medications. Or what happens is they plummet down, uh, they lose six to 10, 12 months worth of function in one to two weeks. So as long as they had a good initial response, they really want them to stay, uh, I really want them to stay on one of these medications pretty much forever. Now, <clears throat> wouldn't it be great if we had medications that actually slow down the ticking clock? Well, there was a new medication that was FDA approved called aducanumab or aduhelm. And I think that you, you sort of know about uh, <clears throat> this medication. Uh, you may have heard about it in the news. The short answer is, I don't think it works and I don't recommend that you use it for your loved one. Okay. Now, after uh, improving their cognition, the next thing I try to do to help behaviors is to help my patients feel calmer. And this usually means using a, a Prozac-like medication, but not Prozac itself. The ones that I like are sertraline, uh, brand name Zoloft, and escitalopram, brand name Lexapro. Those, I think, are particularly good. It helps patients feel more calm. Prazosin is a blood pressure pill that can help if people are feeling very angry. It's good to use at night because it can be sedating. And there's a medication that's essentially dextromethorphan, uh, like the, in Robitussin DM, that dextromethorphan, that can also help people feel more calm. We also, uh, <clears throat> what about uh, denepazone memetine on the bowels and the urinary tract? So I agree, medications can have uh, side effects, but <clears throat> these medications can help. And if you're dealing with a loved one with behavioral problems, denepazil is a lot more mild than some of these other uh, medications. So let me keep going here. So sometimes, as a really almost like a last resort, I think you need to use atypical neuroleptics, things like risperidone and risperdal. But I want to be very clear. This is after I've improved cognition with cholinesterase inhibitors, after I've helped them feel calmer. If they're still having behavioral problems, it's the, if it's the only way to keep them out of a nursing home, uh, <clears throat> then I'll give this a try. And clinical trials can also be helpful. Now, there's a lot of medicines that don't work. So don't waste your money, in my opinion, on Prevagen, curcumin, ginkgo biloba, resveratrol, phosphatidylserine, uh, et cetera. Now, step four is build your care team. And we always recommend starting with the most important member of the care team, which is you, if you are a caregiver, because you can't pour from an empty cup. And for those of you on the chat, uh, feel free, type in what are some ways for caregivers to care for themselves? And while you're typing in your answers, I will share with you a few of the things that we recommend to help with caregivers. Um, exercise, sleep well, eat a healthy diet, maintain social connections, take time for yourself. All of these things are really important. Then we talk about, you know, how do you ask and engage friends, families, neighbors uh, to help? How can you share information and also share tasks with your care team so they can uh, help? 
Support groups, of course, can be helpful. And there's different types. Some give information, some build skills, some are mainly emotional support. Don't forget about professional caregivers, respite care, day program, the Alzheimer's Association, and the doctor should be part of your plan too. Step five is about sustaining your relationship. And we talk about how relationships are going to change in dementia. There's changing interests, changing abilities. You usually take, need to take the lead uh, to help with this. It's good to plan ahead. Start with small uh, uh, outings. Don't start with anything too uh, ambitious. And you often have to go with the flow. Things may not turn out exactly as uh, planned. But don't give up. Keep trying. And there's so many different ways to sustain your relationship. You can visit a memory cafe, go to a museum, performing arts, movies, music, arts and crafts, exercise, nature. Uh, for couples, there's touch and physical intimacy, uh, meaningful activities, and you may even want to participate in research with your loved one together. And then finally, step six is plan for the future. And in this chapter, we talk about, you know, how it's important we want to involve our loved one in the planning process. So that means you need to do it early, right? You can't wait till they're in the moderate stage of dementia. They're not going to be able to participate. So try and involve them uh, early. Uh, it's important to deal with medical legal issues, financial legal issues. Please, please, please protect your loved ones from scams and harm artists and even just poor judgment. And we talk about housing, you know, when is it time? What are the different options? And how do you make the transition to ease them into new housing slowly? Um, uh, sometimes people refuse to plan and that's hard. And we have a few comments about that, but it is hard. Uh, we talk about things that are often uncomfortable to talk about. We talk about ceremony like the funeral. What does it mean to be dying from dementia? Uh, what's the role of hospice and palliative uh, care? Uh, what happens to the body uh, afterwards? Do you want to donate the body for research? You know, if you're interested in that, what do you need to know ahead of time? Uh, because it's you can't wait till the last minute there. And then lastly, we talk about how to plan your own future after your loved one has passed. So those are the six steps to managing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So if you want more information, you can check this book out of your local library, or of course you can get it at any of the usual bookstores or online uh, retailers. I also have a couple of blogs. I have a Psychology Today blog and a Harvard Health uh, blog. You can just Google my name and put in, you know, Andrew Budson Psychology Today or Andrew Budson Harvard Health, and those uh, blogs will come up. I have my email address listed here, uh, abudson at bu.edu. I don't mind if people want to email me uh, directly. I also am on Twitter and Facebook, but I confess I'm not, I'm not super active on either of them. Uh, uh, so email is probably the best way. And I have a website uh, which uh, covers my books and some other uh, information uh, as well. And with that, this is my uh, last slide. I'm very happy to take any questions uh, from anyone. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, you may simply unmute yourself and ask away or if you want to type a question into the chat, I will answer them that way. I hope that was helpful. Forgive me, I missed the four R's. Could you just either go back to the slide or repeat what those four are? It would be my pleasure to go through the four R's because they're so helpful. They are definitely worth uh, repeating. So let me let me get to the four R's. Um, and while I'm answering this one, people can think about other questions that they may uh, have. Okay, let's close that down. Um, okay, so I think you can see the slide now, yes? So the four R's are we want to reassure our loved one that everything is okay. We want to reconsider things from their point of view. 
you know, maybe the reason they're trying to leave the house and go quote unquote home is because they're thinking of the home that they grew up in. We want to redirect them away from whatever it is that's upsetting them and towards something that is both uh, calming and distracting. And then the fourth R is for us as caregivers to take in a deep breath <gasps> and relax. Because if we are upset or frustrated or irritated or annoyed or angry, we're going to reflect that emotion to our loved one and only escalate the situation. So those are the four R's. I did not invent them, uh, but I added the last one and uh, uh, collated them. Other questions? Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, it, it's my pleasure. So I have a question in the chat. Uh, husband in the moderate to late stage is totally incontinent, both urinary and bowels, the most difficult thing to handle. No doctor's help with the bad. Okay, so it looks like we need to we need to finish up. I will say uh, bowel incontinence can be uh, difficult, and um, you know I'm not sure we have time to get into it all now. But one of the first things I try and figure out is you know is it a uh, 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 trouble with the consistency of the stools, or is it simply that the individual isn't really aware or able to tell you if they're uh, going or not. Uh, sometimes uh, a fiber uh, like Metamucil can be helpful in regulating the bowels. Sometimes you can get people into a sort of a habit in a cycle of using the bowels uh, once a day, you know, each, each day. Sometimes that can be helpful. Sometimes it is very hard, and it is one of the reasons that people end up going to um, a, a facility is incontinence of bowel and bladder. So it's difficult for me to uh, give you a, a, a perfect answer without uh, sort of hearing a little bit more about it. it and I, I want to be very upfront, it, it's difficult to handle bowel incontinence. Urinary incontinence are much better at, but bowel incontinence can be uh, difficult to manage. If it's diarrhea, if it's alternating constipation and diarrhea, sometimes some fiber, could even be a fiber cereal, something that's Metamucil is, is helpful. And absolutely uh, consider the, the FODMAP diet. I'm not familiar with that particular diet, but, but I think that that makes sense to me. Okay, so I think we're all supposed to go back to the main stage. I want to be a good team player, so I will see you over there. Bye, everyone. Thank you for, for joining me today, and I hope the book is helpful.